We open on Lister and Rimmer playing a game that's apparently a JMC variation on Monopoly. I've never been beaten at Monopoly, Lister. Undefeated since birth. And Lister is winning. Wonder why. Throw a two and a one and land on my space station, and your bank is erupted, baby. Lister, I'm not gonna throw a two and a one. This discussion reminds me of Rimmer's risk stories. I threw a five and a two. I win. You can't complain about anything I do for an entire week. Well, that's gonna kill Rimmer. Here we go. Anything but a two and a one. Anyway, I'm guessing he won't be bragging about this game because he keeps rolling a two and a one. He keeps making excuses to re-roll, but he keeps getting it. Lister gets a different number. Whoop chairs! They switch chairs, and Lister still gets a different number, but Rimmer still gets a two and a one. Okay, I accept it. Just lucky for you, I'm such a good loser! <laughs> Meanwhile, Crichton and Cat have discovered an escape pod. That's causing minute disruptions to everything in the local vicinity. Someone in the pod tries to warn them. This is very important. You must not For all the good that's gonna do. No matter, sir. I'll remote control the pod into the cargo bay. Yeah, probably shouldn't have done that. Back to Lister and Rimmer. Naturally, Lister is being as annoying as possible. So Rimmer believes that he's cursed and he tells this story. This busker claimed he was an alien and wanted to sell me some lucky space dust. Even at nine, I was no fool. I knew he was real. I miss Rimmer's obsession with aliens. Aliens! At least we got a little nod to it there. And as I walked off, he cursed me for life, and I've never had any luck since. We also get Rimmer telling Lister how he gets all the lucky breaks. I'm alone in deep space with you. How charmed is that? The crew got wiped out. You survived. That's charmed. I survived to live the rest of my life with you. Not charmed. That's another welcome callback to the first couple seasons. I could have been God, you know, given a different start in life, given the lucky showbiz break you had. Bing bong! <laughs> Sorry, sirs. The bing bong machine is being serviced this evening. Heh. <laughs> Girl type Holly said something like that once. Oh, God, not a siren's bus. A wooga! A wooga! A bad shit! Anyway, Crichton tells them about the escape pod and that there were two survivors in it. We're just about to open the booth and take them to the science room for debriefing. Message ends. Bing bong! Sir. Uh, Colonel Green and Professor Barker. I like the little flags. What happened? Well, they appear to have been vaporized, sir. Quite how and why, we're not sure. Anyway, Barker and Green were both officers on the ship, the SS Samsara, and were both married, but not to each other. We believe the ship must have crashed onto this ocean moon. It seems to me we should do two things. One, scatter the ashes, and two, find this ship. <laughs> I wondered when Lister was going to sneeze on the ashes. At least he didn't eat them this time. On to two, then! So they find the ship and explore it. I wonder what happened to Barker and Green. Here's kind of a cool transition to the past. Professor Barker reporting for duty. Barker and Green act like they don't know each other, but secretly they've been having an affair. Let's go to my quarters. <laughs> Back to the present, the Dwarfers are trying to figure out what caused the ship to crash. It's a state-of-the-art research ship with self-repairing engine parts. Crashing should have been out of the question. They end up finding a lot of skeletons in interesting positions. I try to save all the cat stuff for the cat videos, but I can't help but mention that Cat thinks they were all playing Twister, and he complains about how they clearly weren't following the rules, and that's just so precious I could die. According to the Psy Scan, they were flash heated to death. Good old Psy Scan. Anyway, basically they were instantly vaporized, leaving their skeletons in the position they were in when they died. <laughs> Turn that on. The mainframe probably detected us. They come across the captain who appears to have typed a bunch of gibberish. Looks like Welsh after about 15 pints. Because that's how you type when you're being strangled. Because they test that theory. So maybe the captain was strangled by this person here who's been stabbed. They go into the cafeteria where Cat finds a slot machine. He uses money from the orphan fun jar on the top of it to play and wins, but Lister puts the winnings back in the jar. Ah! Suddenly his dreads get caught in a garbage disposal, but Cat frees him with a knife from one of the bodies and then drops it in there. That's gonna come up again. And it does, and then right down into Cat's foot. Ah! And then the power goes out. This seems like just a lot of slapstick, but there's a reason for it. So Cat's foot needs to be fixed and they can't see anything, so Lister gets out a first aid kit with glow sticks. Lots of glow sticks. Good thing they already have holders for them. We can 
why I've been here for days, weeks, months even. Just the two of us. Crichton! <laughs> Meanwhile, Crichton and Rimmer are trying to find their way back to the main hub, and they come across what's called a karma drive. It's based on the old Justice World tech, where the pain an individual inflicts on another is redirected back on them. This whole episode is basically a callback to Justice. The karma drive has two modes, a punishment setting and a reward setting. Well, it creates a karma field that analyzes behavior and then manipulates reality to reward or punish. Interesting. But that doesn't make sense. Morality changes across time and cultures. Who decides what's immoral and moral? Rimmer makes a good point there, but apparently it's programmable. Anyone can implement their moral code of their choice and then force others to live by it. Now Rimmer remembers how he kept throwing a two and a one repeatedly earlier and wonders if Red Dwarf had entered the Karma Drive's field. Why punish me? I wasn't doing anything wrong. Sir, there is no cause for alarm. We're under no danger as long as we don't do anything vindictive, selfish, or unethical. Yeah, you're all screwed. Back to Barker and Green, they were talking about having minor health problems earlier. We now know due to the karma drive. And now their relationship has been discovered. So we're all supposed to live the megacore dream, where the married stay married and everyone eats lots of homemade apple pie. Or you could just not be dicks and get divorced from your spouses if you'd rather be with each other. Back to Lister and Cat. Just give me like 10 minutes. I better come up with a plan. I get great ideas all the time. I just don't say them out loud. You say everything you think out loud. Cat just makes annoying Lister an art form in this one. Rosenthal? Sidney Rosenthal? Who? Invented the magic marker. Magic marker? The guy I'm talking about is real. He ain't no wizard out of a book with his magic pen. The scene is amazing. You can lead a hearse to water, but you can't make it sink. Crichton! Meanwhile, they're in trouble because the Karma Drive is controlling everything, so they have to be kind to each other if they want to survive. An excellent suggestion, Crichton. That's very insightful of you to make such a helpful recommendation. Except it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> and they're about to suffer the same fate as the crew. The ship's quantum motherboards are power loading to flash heat the ship. But Rimmer insulting Crichton fixes it, and they make it back to Lister and Cat. Just when Lister is about to lose his sanity. Brighton, thank God! It's so good to see you. Sir, stop! Don't be nice to me! <laughs> we know what happened to Barker! <laughs> I feel like this is payback for Nanarchy. <laughs> Back to Barker and Green, the Karma Drive really started doing a number on them. Got no choice. Yes, we do. If I can access the KD's mainframe, then perhaps I can reverse the protocol. So it rewards the unethical and punishes the good. I hope I'm not supposed to feel sorry for these two. Crichton, if you weren't so ugly, I could kiss you. Oh, well, you could shake my hand, sir. Still too ugly. Lister goes over everything that happened earlier and how the karma drive reacted. The cat nicked the money out of the orphan fund to play the one armed bandit, and I won the jackpot. You were rewarded for stealing. And we know how the rest of it went. How sad is that? I mean, basically, their love for one another brought down the entire ship. Yes, yeah, sad for the crew. Basically, they were forced to act immorally in an attempt to survive, while Green and Barker stole the only escape pod. And they went into cryo sleep for millions of years, where they were safe. But when they tried to warn us about the karma field, an act of kindness, the karma drive had them vaporized. Hey! How come you got so many Monopoly cards in your back? Busted. And so ends Samsara. This was a good one in my opinion. I remember that when I covered Justice, a lot of people in the comments section complained about how the Justice field doesn't make sense. Frankly, I just chalked it up to rule of funny, but it's kind of neat that the creators brought the idea back so they could explore its flaws and how it could be misused. And yeah, I think they pretty much covered it this time around. Morality is subjective, etc. Like I said, I don't really feel sorry for Barker and Green. Okay, they didn't deserve everything that happened to them, but they could have prevented all of it, including the death of the crew, if they had just put their horn Moans away until they were stationed on another ship, like they talked about. Though the episode doesn't necessarily paint them as sympathetic characters, it generally just kind of presents the backstory and lets the audience decide how to react, which I think is a good way to handle it. Other than Lister mentioning how sad it is that their love caused this, but to be fair, he is kind of a sentimentalist, so he would say that. 
In general, even if it was played for laughs, the bit with the skeletons was still kind of creepy and disturbing, especially once you learn why they were doing that. And I like the general dark atmosphere that this episode had. Even if it is totally ruined with the bizarre sight of skeletons with glow sticks poking out of them every which way. Also, much as I couldn't show much of it yet, Cat really shines in this one and has a lot of great dialogue. This might be my favorite season 11 episode as far as cat lines are concerned, but we'll see. Next up is Give and Take. See you then. Smeg happens, you just roll with it. I've been rolling in Smeg my whole damn life. <laughs> Don't lecture me about Smeg rolling.